now, you know, I mean, so many people are now, you know, very aware of decline in, in pollinators and um, and insects and um, and try to encourage, you know, forage in their garden. But I think they're less aware possibly of the need for those areas that provide height and structure yeah. and they allow, um, you know, butterflies and moths to really complete their life cycle. I think that's a little bit that is less well known. And as part mm -hmm. of our kind of wild spaces, we're trying to get people to include some of those features that are uh, helpful for wild, um, for life cycle completion. So, you mm -hmm. know, species of butterflies and moths do over winter as an egg, or as a caterpillar, or as chrysalis. So what, what do you think would be a good structural plant that would be good for any garden that would, you mm -hmm. know, someone could pop in a corner and, you know, just allow that structure and support insects in that way as well? Mm, this is a this is a good question. This might be where I slightly fall down on my uh, my symbiotic relationship knowledge. Um, I mean, when when you say when you say sort of structure, what what is it that um, what is it that you, that that the, the insects need? They so you, would something like you know a fennel be good? I feel like I know that fennel's great because once it flowers, gorgeous, covered in pollinators. Yes, yeah, perfect. So architectural, so beautiful. Also, if you have the kind that is that's perennial again comes back year on year and year doesn't seem to you know you can cut it down in, in spring and and arguably you know because they, they hollow out that was, that would be a, a decent place to overwinter i would think but it smells nice too <laughs> in multiple functions there because they're great nectar source as well aren't they yeah and, I, and there's as well you know i always let I always let my dill flower i let and anything and, and 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 you know that's also something that i do that i think is um uh not necessarily part of all kind of food growers um practices is i let my crops bolt i let them flower and 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 to kind of see that see their whole life cycle through because obviously once they've reached a point it depends on what but often when it comes to kind of leafy greens once they've bolted and they've flowered they tend to have not be as palatable or we don't necessarily harvest them quite so readily and so more often than not if you're trying to get productivity out of your ground you're just going to take them out of the ground and replace them with something else but but particularly now I might you know the my brassica bed which is going to be turned into the legume bed next is is full of flowers and I'll, I'll replace them with the beans that I'm growing soon enough but whilst I don't have to clear them there is you know it's an incredible riot of beautiful kind of buttery yellows and gorgeous rocket um, flowers it's, it's stunning and it's full of pollinators yeah i i love a parsnip flower i mean it's one of them it's Beautiful. gorgeous isn't it they just uh, just anything with the umbrella yeah and also radish which you know you sow no one eats and then it goes to flower and um <laughs> they're great and um yeah. And, you know, I used to always recommend them to people who just were, you know, uh, to schools. Maybe they don't have very many resources or on a low budget. Mm -hmm. If you want to do a, a little mini pollinator garden on a on a balcony or in a, in a yard, yeah. just buy some of the really cheap veg seeds that you can get for like 50p for a packet mm -hmm. of radishes and you let them flower and you've got a great little mini garden there. Yeah. And, and yeah. herbs are really great for that too. Both the kind of perennial yes. and the and the annuals, like parsley flowers, I love. The coriander flowering is beautiful, and obviously yeah, we've got lots of thyme and and oregano and our and marjoram in our our garden. And when that yeah. flowers, it's stunning. It smells beautiful, and it's absolutely covered, covered, covered in butterflies always. And so yeah, and it's just it's just such an interesting journey as well because it's beautiful and delicious now, and then it will flower and you know generally it's got the, the one I'm thinking of in particular is a margarine that's right next to the house. Yeah, it's, it's got the it's most fantastic. beautiful purple spires, and it's just alive when the when the flowers come out. It's stunning. They just hum, don't they? They're just humming. They're like a big humming bush. <laughs> So, um, Claire, we've talked a lot about um, veg growing, about growing food for the table. And, um, you know, my approach to ornamentals is if you survive my garden, good for you. And if you um, if you can survive, you probably had a very long place on this earth and have evolved alongside other things. So you're very welcome to stay. And there's only a couple of things that I'll pull out of my garden. And that's just to give some other things a bit more of a chance. But you know, do you do you see ornamentals as as a real pleasure in the garden? Um, you know, you're you're of 
Mauritian heritage? Have you included anything in your garden from Mauritius? And does it grow? I mean, tell us more about the ornamental plants that you love, if you allow them space well, in your garden. I do, I do. I, I allow them space in the garden because they they uh, predate my presence. And so out of purely out of respect um, for the gardeners that, that created the space, before I got here and for the plants that have been here long before I was I am very respectful of the plants that are growing here and I've got re some really really beautiful beautiful plants that that um that oh, yes it's my job I think to take care of them and steward them and in particular um I've got this hibiscus which you know when we moved I moved in October so by then it was a naked it was a tree that I didn't know the identity of um and because it's 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 it takes it, it takes its time in this country for a hibiscus to to show itself to show its leaves and then show its flowers and it does, so it doesn't flower until maybe like july or um um yeah maybe about july time um so for a really long time i didn't know who it was and so once it finally showed itself our first summer here which was yeah june july 2020 i, I just couldn't believe that a plant that that i associate with mauritius where my family are from was growing here and not just growing here like small and incidentally like it takes up an enormous amount of room and it's a it's a tree <laughs> and it's stunning and it's it's just it's one of the most important parts of the garden I would say it's it's uh, the 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 heft of the the bumblebees that oh. frequent hours and then just a, a kind of drunkenly covered head to toe in pollen and kind of flying sideways because they're so laden is just it's just a beautiful thing to witness <laughs> like, you know they're, they're all, get, all getting hammered on on like hibiscus pollen yeah. it's great so is it is it in a is it against a warm wall or is it a wee bit sheltered oh, where you have it is it in a hot would you believe it's actually growing out of uh, out of the gravel, but it's growing definitely into the ground. So there's a there's a gravel there's yeah. a gravel area which is, um, but it's it's membraned and then underneath is definitely soil, and um, it's probably in the sunniest spot actually, which is not that surprising. Um, and it's probably yeah probably in the corner that's that's fairly warm, but it's not particularly sheltered. My garden's not that sheltered at all actually because we're halfway up a hill, so we get quite a lot of wind that kind of whistles through. Um, but it's a tough cookie and, and arguably it's quite naked for the the months of the year where it's a little less friendly weather, shall we say. But it's time. It didn't fall <laughs> safe to your hebe, so it was, it was yeah. uh, more robust than your hebe. Yeah. I, that, you know what, a close second. That hebe was beautiful. If I could have, yeah, I would, I would definitely a close second to the hibiscus. It's it such an established hebe and... It flowered in the most stunning way with these kind of white mm. spirals, gorgeous, gorgeous flowers. And it was absolutely heaving with, with hoverflies and butterflies. And, and yeah, it just didn't make it through the blizzard from December last year. It was just oh. such, such heavy snow. I've never seen it like this before. And there's, it, there's, there's it, it and a couple of other quite high-profile high casualties didn't make it through, actually. There's a few things that I, I'm looking at now and realising that, they have they've not grown back so yeah it's a it's been interesting to uh to to learn what will and won't survive i mean it's very possible that the hebe was was done and the hebe had it was very well established it might have just been like that's it i've lived i've fed many many mouths i'm done but i'm, I'm, I'm guessing going to die it. under this beautiful blanket of snow <laughs> <laughs> it's like quite a romantic death you know <laughs> <laughs> and it's definitely gone, has it? You've given it a really hard rejuvenating prune, and there's no sign of life. There's, a, um, I'm going to, I'm certainly going to try. I haven't given up on it. Yeah. The thing that's happened is that the, there's some honeysuckle that is like fantastic, and has seen this opportunity mm. to just stop growing over the top of it. So I'm going to give, I'm going to give it a prune. I'm going to see, I'm going to see. I, I, I am still sort of mourn, mourning that loss because that was there's a little bench that we my, my partner had made a bench out of off cuts of wood and popped it in front of it so it used to be a very delicious place to kind of sit and, and listen to the buzz um so yeah i have to figure out what what else we can plant to make it buzzy there <laughs> well you're just again perfectly leading me on to another question i want to ask you <laughs> you'd think we'd rehearse this wouldn't you and um, you've You've, re you've written recently about feeling quite overwhelmed by environmental issues, which I think a lot of us can empathise with. It does yeah. all feel really 
too much doesn't it at times but that you've taken mm-hmm. great comfort from your garden what aspect of garden wildlife do you find p- particularly comforting and which job in the garden gives you sort of the greatest joy or sense of well-being mm, that's a beautiful question gosh i mean I, th- I suppose the thing that gives me the most the most hope i think is when i'm doing anything and i mean it connects to everything that we've talked about when i'm doing anything that reminds me that my role in the garden is not to is not one of dominion it's not one of control it's not I'm not trying to exert myself and my will and my, you know, my eye for aesthetics or whatever on, on the garden. I I am participating in creating an ecosystem that thrive, that thrives. And, and, and as a result, I thrive too. You know, it's, it's so important to me to see that there are things, little things that I can do that um, make it possible for for there to be yeah thriving for there to be life for there to be balance you know and and and, and often it's it's encountering a species of of Absolutely. insect or yeah but generally it is insect because that, that's the one that i find hardest to you know running around with an app i'm, I'm like i make it sound really bucolic <laughs> what I'm doing is i've got my phone and i've got an identifier app yeah. and i am chasing some a, a butterfly some insect of some such yeah. because i'm like who are you how did you get here? You know, I I want to I want to know who they are, and I want to find out what where they live and what they need, and whether I can provide that in some way or another. You know, there's um there's a, a section of my my uh, which bed is it now? It's probably my brassica bed actually that has a, a ragwort that comes back every year, mm. and it's enormous. It takes up a lot of room, but it's also like yeah i guess this is this is your space it's it's you know it's it's safely enclosed in my veg patch we don't have any cattle or horses yeah. so you know there's no animals that could possibly be um passed by and be threatened by it and you know the the cinnabar moths come back every year mm, and they and it's the most amazing thing and i mean it's obviously like incredible to watch and sort of gruesome but they completely decimate that plant down to the earth and yeah. and then i to see the moths and and, I, and occasionally I do and even if I don't I get to watch their amazing caterpillars kind of wriggling around and living in this space that I have said you know what that might be the brassica bed but that's for you you know and yeah. and I think that's that's the thing that gives me the most life when I'm in the garden is that um I'm trying to I'm trying to learn about it I want to learn its language I want to hear its song I want to know who it is and and know that I'm part of it as opposed to like yeah someone who is exerting itself yeah it's really nice and I think it is those chance encounters isn't it that are so satisfying and I think gardeners are very good at those because well we walk about the garden very slowly I think I do anyway walk about and stand and stare around and and then we're doing this close plant work so we're quite likely to see uh, you know small insects and things and I think that's why gardeners make good naturalists but those chance encounters are just you know just have you hopping about the garden don't they I mean you just get so excited I was talking, you know, thinking about the structure question we we're talking about before I mean I'm a great fan of planting a stick of willow in a pot and allowing a small willow tree to grow Absolutely. beautiful I mean you know just free plants yeah. and you don't hardly need anything you know gorgeous so I have lots of willow in the garden in pots and in beds and stuff. Amazing. And um, earlier this year, I, w- w- I went to actually go, you know, cut your willow down a bit if you want to manage it. And I went to cut it down. And thankfully, I noticed that on the sunny side of the willow, there was thousands of caterpillars had aligned themselves on the sunny side of the willow uh, on oh. all of the stems. Thousands of them. Like, they, were, they were probably a moth or they might have been a sore fly. I'm not sure. But... Amazing. It was just spectacular. I know it was spectacular, yeah. you know, and it's okay. just those garden moments are very special, aren't they? And it's and it's also you know they're fleeting, you know, yeah. as well. Like they change, everything changes so much. But I do think I do think the best kind of growers and gardeners are the ones that take the time to watch, you know, and and get and take the time to like learn the rhythm of their garden and and, and it's only and, and, and no, notice the changes and be present in that because you know if you were 
as somebody who who wasn't that engaged, you'd have missed them because, you know, they won't be there forever. They'll be there only for maybe a handful of days or a couple of weeks at max, you know, and it's it's beautiful to be present when those moments that you don't just get to have every day arise. It's amazing. Like I, I, I was brushing my teeth the other day. I said I, I did a video of it, which is actually genuinely embarrassing because you can see, hear what it sounds like when I'm taken by surprise. But a Maybug came in the window. It's so warm, all our windows are open. And it was so beautiful. And it has this sort of very, like, delightful Disney face with a little... And I was like, you're gorgeous. And was, like, videoing it so I could show my partner. And suddenly it took off and it has, like, a brrrr noise. <laughs> you can just see me, like, Wah! and run off. But, you know, it was stunning. It's May, of course. Thank goodness. Like, yeah. came in to say hello. <laughs> And this is a just, this is a really wonderful <laughs> sense of joy and well-being that everyone should have access to, isn't it, Claire? You know, why, yeah. why, why are people denied access to this wonderment and joy? And it's, and it's really wow. heartbreaking that people have no access to land. And that kind of brings me on to mm. our final question. So in your book, Unearthed, on race and roots and how the soil taught me I belong, you really explore um, the importance of growing in nature for developing mm. that sense of identity and belonging. And like the horticulture sector, the conservation sector has much to do in terms of mm. increasing diversity and inclusion. And I would just really like us to finish on some positive examples of where you have seen that mm. work, where it's been genuinely meaningful and where a wider range of people have been included and given the opportunity to have access to all of the wonderful things that we've been talking about today? Mm. Yeah, I mean, gosh, I mean, it's a big question, isn't it? It's it a is. big issue. And we could, I mean, we could we could have another hour and have this conversation and this do, couldn't we? But I mean, if I was to think of, of the sort of good examples and inspiring and, and enlivening examples, I mean, the, the spaces that I've seen that are that feel genuine that feel welcoming inclusive interesting vibrant they're the ones that have arisen from they're, 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 they're grassroots I mean it's I don't mean to be quite so <laughs> cliche but they've arisen out of it in a space where a community exists and is invested in that space and are engaged and empowered and you know a bit like the, the Wolves Lane space I was talking about earlier any of the kind of community gardens that I've been in um and I and also have seen other you know other community gardeners working that are embedded in community and embedded and, and engaging with the people that are surrounding it you know and and it, allotments are really great for that because the the even though I grew up with a sense of alienation from the natural world and, and a feeling that like to to grow to garden was like not part of who I ought to be or who I what I was like culturally aligned with it's just not true you know we are much like I say in the book like we're all descended from a lineage of land stewards of land workers and and, and it's so in our blood and bones and it's like something at least it has been in my experience and I know I'm not alone that to be able to tap into that really deep sense of um, of knowing that we have that we are part of the natural world that we belong to the natural world inherently and that that we are that ancestrally those those skills that knowledge that wisdom that instinct it belongs to us and if we can tap into it if you know and, and obviously you know this doesn't necessarily speak to the the problems of access because that is much more of a kind of uh, a conversation about a political conversation about an inequality and an inequity of access of, of land holding and land injustice but you know when it comes to to the very personal practice of growing I do at least for me it has been completely pivotal to understanding my place in this this great and wonderful ecosystem that we are and, and, and to feel called to protect it you know and to feel called to be part of what what enables it to thrive in an ongoing way you know and and that's it it's, it's a big ask and I think that's why gardens are, can be such empowering places because we can there, if we all felt that we could engage in our in the space just outside of our doors and make them thrive then all of those thriving spaces they all link up you know they're all that that adds up to something and and I think if you feel so empowered then it feels empowering to 
to to be to, to grow in that way to be part of it in that way it, it really it really is empowering and it's making best use of space and it is improving access because we're taking these places that are not used really hmm. but get, getting that off the ground what do you think the barriers are there is it about relationship building is it about people just having that kind of sense of I can do this, I can pal up with my neighbour, we can go and, and, and ask permission. Someone's just taking that first step, isn't it, into finding out who owns the land and, and asking yeah. those questions. And Well, again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated landscape, isn't it? Because, I mean, if you look at the, the way things are at the moment with the cost of living crisis, how hard people are having to work to make ends meet, sometimes it's about time or about resources or about energy yeah. or about funding you know and 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 that is so incredibly unfortunate that that it, it means that only certain people will have access to even just the, the time and the energy to yeah, pursue yeah. a great project yeah. like that it's just yeah. it just really breaks my heart because I know how how beneficial it can be in s such a multifaceted way for us to all have access to to space in which to grow or space in which to dwell where other people are growing vibrantly it doesn't necessarily have to be that you you're the person who leads the charge no. that you're the person who i don't know invites people in cooks you know cooks, there's, there's so many role, there's a role for everybody to create spaces where both the humans can and live in relationship to the natural world and these kind of grown and wild spaces I mean, m many conservationists kind of like talk about their patch. You know, we have, it's not land that we necessarily own, but it's, we, we call it our patch, you know, and yeah. I'm going down, this is from my patch, or I've just seen a, such a thing on my patch, and we observe the, the wildlife there and record it. And, and, and quite often we will take action on the ground to, you know, look after that site. Mm. And yeah, I just think it's about making sure that organizations like ours are, are opening up more and reaching more people yeah. so that we can say this is something you can join in with and yeah. let us know what it is you need help with you know rather than we will do undo we will do a project onto you you know yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. How, well, that's a beautiful <laughs> paradigm shift i really love i love that idea of of our of my patch our patch not necessarily being about ownership right because yeah. because ownership is also a really a really limited I mean, it's it's socially, legally, whatever. It is often the way that we have access to land is the parameters are are designated by by ownership, you know, and, and that is obviously inherently tied to, to money. Whereas, if you have a sense of your patch being transcending borders, transcending fences, transcending you know the yeah. the lines that are on on maps and on deeds, then that's so it's such a beautiful thing because that that is how nature operates nature doesn't operate with with those kind of arbitrary boundaries in place you know and i think that that is something that we we ought to be talking more about creating porousness in around that i mean I, i'm somebody who who embodies uh, the, the, what it looks like to be a, of multiple places and so for me borders boundaries you know kind of limitations around what is possible are of, of no interest to me and so I really love the idea of like I, I, we were the house next door is for sale and we were joking with a friend who would have loved to have moved into it and you know, we had this idea where we'd like and would it be amazing if we could tear down the fence and and we just have this garden that's ours you know and I'm like <laughs> yeah. and many of us were like and we'll talk to the lawyer and we'll figure out the exact terms and that we'd have we just thought god wouldn't it be amazing if we could just knock down all these fences and just have nothing between all of our spaces and I just yeah I think I love I love that idea of our patch going beyond that which we own and actually being more about what we're in relationship with what we steward what we care for what we observe what we yeah. spend time in you don't have to own it to look after it yeah yeah no absolutely no um Claire with that that is very sadly yours running out of time and oh. it is it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I could talk to you for the rest of the afternoon. It's been a delight. <laughs> it's been a delight to have you with us. Thanks very much for sharing all your expert um, knowledge and advice. And uh, yeah, very best of luck in all your future projects.
Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's a, been a gorgeous conversation. I, oh, I, I too would love to talk to you. So I've got lots to learn about butterflies. And, well, you, you know, know I, I, we're an open I door. Do, it doesn't just have to be me running around with the app. I could take a picture and, and ask you what it is. That would be a, absolutely. A now, please stay in touch with us. We'd we'd love to we'd love to work with you more. I'd love that too. Thank oh, you so, thank so you. much. Thank you. You're welcome.